Hi, I'm Daniel Wordsworth. For more than 30 years, I've experienced war zones, natural disasters, refugee camps, and sprawling slums. Now I'm going to show you a better and more optimistic world. This podcast is Finding Good. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Fitz. We get a lot of listeners to the podcast from around the world. Yeah. So I want to thank you for listening to us wherever you are. We've got a large audience in the US now in the States. Mm -hmm. What I find interesting is normally when you look at podcast listening, it goes to the big cities. It's LA, New York, San Francisco, Chicago, Boston. Mm -hmm. A large part of our US listening audience is in Minnesota. Yeah. Why would that be? Well, because I live there. Right. So, a so lot, these are your uh, friends. These are, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of them are my friends or they're people that I know. Alight, the organization that I was running before coming here, yeah. is based in Minneapolis, which is Minneapolis-St. Paul in the state of Minnesota. Okay. And so that's where I was for about 11 years. What were you doing there? Well, this this is uh, the Alight organization was the organization that was working with refugees around the world. Yes. So around they're working today around with about 4 million refugees. Not so much in the US, but you know all the stories that I'm a lot of the stories that I'm telling are actually from that time when I was in Alight. Mm -hmm. uh, what's also distinctive about Minneapolis and Minnesota is that it's the home of the largest Somali diaspora and they became a big part of my life and they're some of our listeners. And so I do know those folks pretty well. So I'm not familiar with that. What's diaspora? I don't know what the technical definition is. Like uh, it's a – well, I'll just describe who they are. Mm -hmm. There's about between 75,000 to 100,000 Somalis that live in Minnesota and most of them are refugees. Right. So the country of Somalia went into civil war from about 1991-92 and there are literally millions of Somalis that have been scattered around the world. Right. And what happens is that's the diaspora. Right. It's like the ones that are scattered. Yes. And what happens is they get scattered. There's a bunch that go to the US and then over time they begin congregating typically in communities because they'll know each other actually and they'll hang out there. Minneapolis is the, I think, the second largest uh, Somali city outside of Mogadishu. It's certainly the political, in many ways, the sort of political capital of the diaspora. Right. It's so you, and you were working with the Somali diaspora in that. Yeah, city. yeah, yeah. I did. I had the pleasure of spending a lot of time with them. It happened. It happened in a different kind of way. So when I went to a light, I went there with a very specific purpose in mind. We've also talked about this on an earlier podcast, mm -hmm. and it's around the idea of why do nonprofits like World Vision or Alight exist? And often when you ask that question, people say, well, to help children or to help the poor, things like that. Yeah. That's partially true. That's the mission of the organization. But you say, why does this particular organization exist? And nonprofits were created, and they're really an American invention, but they were created about 120 years ago to be a vehicle to allow everyday people to enact social change. Okay. So prior to the nonprofit, you had either the government or the king or the ruler and the church that were responsible for all the social things. The US recognized that there needed to be a way that an average everyday person, if that person wanted to engage with other people in their community to do good, they needed a way to do that that didn't penalize them. So they gave them tax deductibility and it became a nonprofit. So the purpose of a nonprofit is to mobilize everyday people to do good. And yet, what had happened over time is that I increasingly saw that nonprofits began thinking it was about themselves. <laughs> and they sort of shut out everyday people. They're like, no, you can. Send us money. Mm -hmm. You can uh, volunteer with us a little bit, but leave it to the experts to do this kind of work. Yeah. And we sort of drove everyday people out of our offices. And then we, we then we start talking about things like transparency. So we say, there's a window. You can peer through the window. You can watch what I'm doing, but you can never get involved and do what I'm doing because I'm the expert on this. Right. And I just thought this is a dumb idea, yeah. one. And two, we haven't made... I mean, we're making some strides on social things, but it's not like we couldn't use some more help on doing that. Right. And by the way, it's the job of a nonprofit to allow not have windows, but to open the front door and allow everyday people to come inside. And so I wanted to create or I wanted to be part of a nonprofit and lead one that saw its goal to unleash the idealism of everyday people to do good in the world, where the nonprofit itself is the servant to that idealism. And Alight was this perfect sized organization, meaning it was working all over the world, yes. had country programs already going. It's legit, but it was small enough that I could 
you know, innovate or change the way it showed up. And uh, so I went to the board when early on when I started and I said, we're going to create this organization that throws open the doors, allows ordinary people in, and then we're going to participate with them in doing good in the world. And the board was like, okay, sounds awesome. Yep, come back to us when you got your first group. So around that same time, I was doing a radio interview and the, uh, the interviewer at the time said, where should a light be working? And it's not. And I said, we should be working. This is in 2009, actually, when this is happening. Yep. And uh, I said, we should be working inside Somalia because Somalia is in such a dreadful situation and the humanitarian response is not good enough. I didn't even know at that time that there was such a big Minnesotan community because I'm Australian. I, I'd only just yeah. moved to Minnesota. And uh, by the time I got back to my office, we had all these telephone calls from a Somali community. Right. Now, I'd also done, and I think this is a um, it's part of a leadership style, but one of the first policies that I'd put in place when I started at Alight was that anyone that rings up the office, because I, you know, this is the idea of the doorway, right? Yes. How do I let people in? So I made a policy. Anyone that comes through that door yep. gets to see me. People were like, you're the CEO. You're meant to be super <laughs> yeah. busy. You're meant yeah. to be like, your time is valuable. And I was like, actually, I'm going to be the opposite. My time is valuable, so I want to meet people that come in off the street and want to do good. They want to help, yeah. Why? Because that's my job, yes. by the way. It's all about job, by the way. And so we had a policy. Anyone that comes to the door, anyone that rings, anyone that emails gets to see me within two weeks, unless you're a telemarketer. But at that time, <laughs> that wasn't such a big thing. And we opened the doors up. So when the, all the Somalis called up, the person said, well, he'll see you. And there was one guy in particular, though, who didn't just call up. So within the next 24 hours, he showed up. His name was Saeed Sheikh Abdi. Mm -hmm. So he comes off the lift. And, and to make the sort of symbol of this, my office was next to the lift door. So when you hop off the list, there's the reception and my office is sitting right there. Right. And the point we were making, before that, the office of the CEO was the furthest one away from No, it the should front. be the closest to the door. should be the closest one to the door. And uh, he turned up and they said, well, he's just sitting in there. Because I, I do keep my calendar open. I think all this business stuff is just silly talk. Yeah. I tried to meet a CEO once and they said he's so busy he can't meet anybody for three months. And he ran a children's museum in Minnesota. I mean, honestly. <laughs> honestly. He's so yeah, busy. Show me your diary. What sort of meetings are you going? What, what, what are you doing there? Yeah. So uh, he comes into me and says, you said on the radio that you want to help inside Somalia. And I said, no, what I said was, where should we be inside Somalia? Yeah. He said, well, why aren't you there inside Somalia? And I said, no one's inside Somalia. It's so dangerous in there that all the aid agencies are in places like Kenya and they're parachuting aid in, literally parachuting aid in, right. dropping it from dropping aeroplanes, crates. dropping crates and food from aeroplanes because it was deemed at that time impossible for a sort of non-Somali organization to be inside Somalia. And he said, well, what if I could help you get in there? And I said, well, we're open to it then. Mm -hmm. So I said, why don't you get a group of Somalis together and come and talk to me and let's see what we can do together because I need help. So a, a few days later, he came back with 30 Somalis. And they sat in the room and they said, uh, we've talked about it. We want to help you be the first organization headquartered inside Somalia, based inside Somalia. And if you do that, we will help you do it. Uh, we'll give you our advice, our guidance, yeah. our connections, but, but we want to do it together. So we, we made an agreement. I said, okay, so here's the deal. They said, we will help you, but you must be transparent and you must be accountable and you must be the first organization inside Somalia based. When they say you must be transparent, what, does, what do they mean by that? Tell them where the money is going. Tell okay. them the kind of things you're doing. Like treat them like real partners. Yeah. And then I said, well, the deal is this. We will do that. But you can't be factional or regional. We will only go to the areas of greatest need. You can't try to, you know, pick certain places, which is a jerk thing to say because they never even went close to that. Right. <laughs> uh, but there was all this suspicion, which we'll get into. It was all this suspicion at the time. I said, but you will – we don't have enough money to go in – so you will raise the first two hundred thousand dollars to go in. Now I didn't, and that's for setup. That's like that, that's that was just a putting, made up. That was a made up number. Oh, okay. You because, didn't done a P and L or because, anything. No, because it actually cost two to three million dollars to launch a whole new country program. But I thought the two hundred thousand stop them in their tracks. Yeah. 
Like 50,000 is not enough. One million would too frighten much. them too much. Yeah. So I thought, what's in the middle somewhere? 200,000. Okay. This doesn't sound like <laughs> terrible, but it's a lot. So I said, you have to raise the first 200,000. Now, what I wasn't expecting for them to go, deal. <laughs> yeah, deal. <laughs> We're going. We're doing it. And so we said, okay, let's do it uh, together. And we actually signed a, a memorandum between uh, the Somali community in the Twin Cities and uh, the organization, uh, Light. And I went to the board at the next board meeting. I said, great news. I found the first group that we're going to co- – I found the first group that we're letting through the front door and co-creating with. And they're like, that's super awesome. Who are they? Now, here's the background to this. At that time, the Somali community in Minnesota were under investigation by the FBI in a thing called Operation Rhino. 25 young Somalis from Minnesota had just gone back and fought for Shabab, the terrorist organizations. Mm -hmm. The whole Somali community in Minnesota was in the front page all the time in trouble, under suspicion. Yeah. Just a very maligned community and mistrusted. And so when I said to the board, we found our first community and they said, who is it? You know, is it the University of Minnesota? Yeah. No. <laughs> is it General Mills, which is the big cereal company yeah. or Best Buy that's based there? <laughs> no, it's not them. Who is it? Is it the Rotary Club? No. It's the Somali community. Everyone's silent. You're doing what? You're letting the whole Somali community in? I said, yes. And actually I've signed a memorandum. <laughs> it's like <laughs> we're doing this co-creation. Everybody said, that's not a good idea. Even Somalis would say, you know, we're very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> they say, you know, we're very pretty difficult. We're pretty yeah. argumentative. And, uh, but if you want to do it, we'll do it. And this guy, Saeed, he's a total legend, mm-hmm. the guy that pulled it all together. He is such a hustler, that guy. I'll tell, this is an associated <laughs> story with him. Saeed Sheikh Abdi is this guy's name. I went with him once to this gathering in Dubai for the World Congress of Muslim Philanthropists. And it was like in this big hotel on the fifth floor. And in there, in this meeting, big meeting of all the great Muslim philanthropists of the world, mm-hmm. there was a Saudi, a member of the Saudi royal family was there. And he, but they were in this sort of area that was fenced off. You couldn't go and see them. But he knew that we were on the fifth floor and that at some point they would have to either go up or to go down. So he went out to the elevator and he knelt down in front of it and pretended to tie his shoes. And he sat like that for two and a half hours, <laughs> tying his shoe, two and a half hours, waiting at the elevator for, right for the right person to come along. And as soon as they, he saw the button get pushed, it opened, and the Saudi uh, royal walked in, he stood up, went in the elevator with the person, rode down the five floors and pitched like the real yeah. ele- <laughs> elevator. elevator pitch. Yeah, didn't work, but I still thought, <laughs> what a legend. <laughs> Two and a half hours tying up your shoelace, uh, <laughs> that's Saeed. Yeah. I didn't realise at the time, I had no chance. Like that person was getting me to go inside Somalia. I didn't stand a chance. I, right. I was it, was, gonna, it was always going to It was happen. always going to happen once he decided it was going to happen. Yeah. So we said, okay, we'll do this thing. Now I did spend a year and a half with some other colleagues, Sarah and Saeed helping us. And we just we went door to door through the Somali community because you can't say you're partnering with people if you don't actually know who they are. So I almost met every single member of the Somali community. We also hired IDEO, the design firm that I've mentioned before, because how does an organization like Alight actually partner with the diaspora community? No one had done that before. And th- this is a this is a also typical innovation story. When we first told everybody that we were going to partner with the diaspora, everybody. Every single person said, spectacularly dumb idea. In, in a listing of dumb ideas, you may get an award for dumbest idea ever in our sector. You will be granted an award for this. Why is that? Uh, diaspora communities are sh- shockingly political. Uh, diaspora communities will try to capture you. Uh, elements of the diaspora community will try to capture you for their particular regions. My own team. Members oh, people within, of, within your of my own organization said, dumb idea. Minnesota you get press, told that a fair bit. I get told this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and it's only right about half time. Okay. <laughs> so everybody, US government, everyone, this is dumb, 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 spectacularly dumb. You're the winner of all the dumb ideas of the last century. Yeah. So we go, well, we're going to try it anyway. And uh, we did it. We spent 18 months going door to door. And we then hired IDEO. And, and what IDEO did was to try to say, because the community had a lot of problems with trust. And what we discovered when we did all this work was, because we had to launch, we wanted to launch inside Somalia 
and do humanitarian work. And that you need money to do that. Yeah. So we need donations. And yet when we went out to the community, the non-Somali community, they would say, you, the Somalis are like a basket case. It's, you know, it's hopeless that if I give you donation money, at best it will do nothing. At worst, you'll fund a terrorist. Mm. So we couldn't get any donations. And when we talked to the Somali diaspora, they would say, we don't trust you. Like, who are you? And we don't even trust each other most of the time. There's no one that can operate across the whole country. Everybody's very factional inside right. Somalia. And uh, they said, so no one would do it. So we did all this research to work out how do we have these conversations? How do we talk to non-Somalis about Somalia in a way that works and that creates belief and creates trust and allows them to donate? How do we talk with the Somali diaspora in a way where they trust us and want to work with us? And that's what we work with IDEO on. And we did come up with this campaign. And we began this process of real partnership. And it's sort of remarkable how timing works. It took 18 months to do this. And finally, we were ready to launch. Now, they hadn't raised the 200000 at this stage, but they had promised to, so we were going to go with it and do our first assessment. So we were sending a team of three people in, a guy called Adan, Saeed, and another fellow called Eric. They were flying into Hergesa, which is the really southern area in the far northern part of the country. And they, so we put them on the airplane. We were flying them via Nairobi to go in. Now, as they were flying... Famine of 2011 was declared inside mm -hmm. Somalia. So, you know, when a famine's declared, a famine's a very serious thing. It's got to, you've got to meet all these indicators. It's a super legit thing when a famine's been declared. Right. So while they were flying, a famine got declared. This was like a Saturday. And when they landed, we said we called them up. Now, what had happened on that Saturday is that there a group of these sort of young Somali um men and women, you know, people in their teens and early 20s, they did a car wash in a place called Cedar Riverside in Minneapolis. But they're smileys and they did a car wash. As part of their fundraising. When they go, the famine's happening. Yeah. Let's raise money for the famine and we'll raise it for a light and this initiative. It's called I Am A Star. Right. The star is the symbol of Somalia, blue star. They raised $8,000 in a car wash, really successful one. And the boys landed, the guys landed in Nairobi and we, they called up, you know, do the, and we said, change of plans. You're no longer flying to Hergesa. Famine's been declared. We've booked your tickets. You're flying to Mogadishu. Now, I don't know what Mogadishu sounds like today when you bring it up. At that time, Mogadishu was, it was maybe the most dangerous city on earth, maybe yeah. at that time. And we said, we're diverting you into Mogadishu to work on the famine response. And they were like, okay, what funds have we got? $8,000. From a car wash. <laughs> From a car wash <laughs> that Shukri and her team had just done. And they were like, $8,000? Because that may, I don't know if that sounds like, a, that doesn't sound like a lot it of money. It doesn't sound like a lot of money no. if you're going in to help a community or a country. In the middle of a, siding in a famine. Yeah. It wasn't a lot of money. And they were like. I mean, warlords are likely to you know, try and rob you and go, $8,000, you keep it. Keep it, yeah, you can have <laughs> it's that. That's all you got. So they went with $8,000. Now, our promise had been to the Somali community when we started. We said, remember, we said that they had to raise the first 200,000. So mm. they were eight grand into that. Okay. And we promised them. <laughs> 192 to go. go. <laughs> we promised them that if they raised 200,000, that we would raise all the rest. So in they went. We went in with $8,000. And the temptation is to look at small things sometimes and to be dismissive of it. But you know what they did with that 8,000? They went to a place called the Banadir Children's It's a maternal children's hospital, Banadir, in Mogadishu. They went straight to that children's hospital, and that was like a gathering point. And a lot of because you know, in a famine, people are mal kids are malnourished, so that's what it's like. Yeah. Children's hospital is where parents take their children as they're at the final stages of acute malnutrition. And so, when they went into this hospital, it, the place was overrun with families and children who were malnourished, and they didn't have enough beds. And so they, everybody was just most not everybody. There was some people on beds, but everybody was just sleeping and lying on the floor. So this whole hospital is just people everywhere lying on the floor. Mm. And so they took that eight thousand dollars. They went to the marketplace and they got all these beds made. And so within a few days, they had everybody off the floor and in proper beds and with sheets and blankets yeah. and things like that. But that's what eight thousand dollars did, and that launched that program. What's also remarkable about that? That was in two thousand and eleven. And within uh, 10 years, a light had raised $107 million. So we wow, $107 million. Yeah. So they raised initially 8000 For that community, for that, for for that country. For Somalia, for, yeah. wow. 
That program that we did with them in partnership ended up raising $107 million. Most, and they started with 8,000. They fulfilled their promise. They raised the first 200,000 in the first few months for the famine. And then we took it from there and got another 107 million. I think just in the last year, that program was $20 million annual revenue. Wow. And it's all over Somalia. Turning $8,000 into 107 million sounds like, not a, bad. sounds like a success book. Yeah, the Somalis <laughs> were like, that's a pretty good investment. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're, they're a very that's good, good business community. That's a pretty good return. <laughs> yeah, a good return. That's crazy. Yeah. You know, one of the best things about that experience was um, if you're a community and your country's been at war for maybe 20 years and maybe you're a refugee and maybe you weren't even born, like maybe you're 17, you're like that uh, Muhammad that I mentioned who'd been in a refugee camp from yeah. 6 to 16. The country that you see in the news is one of bombed out, you know, like Black Hawk Down and what's the name of that pirate movie with Tom Hanks? They got shot at the same time. The Somali guy was from Minnesota. The world is showing you all the time how bad your country is, how dangerous the people are or how needy they are. And imagine just being told that all the time. I mean, one of the things they said to us was, get us off the front page, please. You know, the diaspora... Get us off the front page. Get us off 25 of us becoming terrorists. Get us off car bomb going off in Mogadishu. Get yeah. us off basket case. Get us off, you know, we don't, we think we're not that. So how do you change that narrative? Yeah, that's so that was the, the, how do you help people believe again? We had to rebrand what it meant to be Somali. Mm -hmm. We had to rebrand what it meant to be the, what Somalia was like. That's what we ended up doing. And what's lovely was, there was one guy in Dubai, I was showing him what we had done and I showed him the way we talked about Somalia and Somalis and he looked up at me and said, I always knew deep down that we were beautiful but I, I could never see it until now. Thank you for showing me how beautiful we are. And then I went to this group in London and I'm – which because it took off. Diaspora's all over the world. It took off. 60 countries, everything took off. But the one group older diaspora than Minnesota is in London. And I, we had to go over there and crack that nut. So I go over there with Saeed and we have his meeting with like 12 young 20s, 30s Somalis. And I sat down with them in this restaurant and they were very upset at me, very mad. Who in the Sam Hill are you? Look at you, guy. You're over here. One, you're from Minnesota. We think of ourselves as the capital of the diaspora. You Minnesotans, you're just Johnny Come Latelys. But you're not even a Minnesotan, one. You're not even Somali, two. Take a look at you. You're Australian and you're over here telling us about Somalia and what we can all do together. And, and they, they were so mad at me. And I said, before you throw me out, let me just show you something because we had made this beautiful film about what we were trying to do. I said, give me two minutes. And they said, okay. I showed them this crying, crying, they're all hugging me, <laughs> they're all getting selfies. They're like, that's how we see ourselves. We didn't know anyone else saw us like that. That's who we really are. It was like we revealed something that they knew they were. They would say, when we're with you, we're like, it's like, a little bit like that Mother Teresa, it's like son, we're seeing who we really are. When you're such a malign community, we did a piece of media research. How many positive stories were told about Somalia or the Somali diaspora in the two years prior to us starting this? Yeah. We found four stories. Wow. Within six months, we got 700 positive stories wow. uh, for the Somali That's community amazing. and the Somali diaspora. 700 positive stories. It was uh, really beautiful. And the program got started. We were the first NGO operating in there. It's all taking off. That's simply amazing. But then I had, we had a lovely moment. In, in the early part, everybody was like, this is really dumb. And it was me, Sarah, and Saeed, and maybe a person called Jessica. There's a few, it's like a very small handful that believed in any of this. And, uh, and then it all started working. And it all just worked in this big, awesome way. Once it was working... Is that when the governments and the other organisations come in and want to piggyback yeah, off the yeah. back of it? That happens. But, uh, well, uh, yeah, I'll get into that, actually, what did happen. Because then Bono got involved and Secretary Clinton got involved, which is good. I mean, they were really trying to help Somalia. Also, what's funny is everyone that was really negative about us started saying this was always going to work. 
Like, what's, uh, it's obvious. <laughs> now I would say in the US in particular, any humanitarian response now that involves a diaspora, you have to explain how you're working. It's now enshrined in humanitarian work that you work with diaspora. Before then, it was seen as the worst thing you could do because of capture. Yeah. Now, everyone does it. And it was because of us. I'm not surprised there were people going, of course it was going to oh, work. Of course it was going to work. Did anyone else try and claim it as their the, idea first? The <laughs> biggest naysayer of the group sat in front of me and I watched, have you ever seen cognitive dissonance form inside a person where you can actually watch their head make yeah. all these movements, their eyes twitch, their ears twitch, their <laughs> mouths twitch. As, as he said, this was always going to work, this was obvious, this was, and then he was the one that said, um, but you'll never make it work for the government, which is the one we talked on the Abraham episode where I said, no, I'm going to make it work for the government. You watch. That's the uh, Hollywood but in the Congo here's episode. Here's a lovely yeah. Yeah, Hollywood in the Congo episode. You could never make that work with the government. Okay, you watch. What, and then they go, why, how are you, why are you so sure of this? Are the humans in the government? Yes. Well, then it's going to be fine. Yeah, <laughs> humans are fine. Humans respond well when you believe in them, actually. You're all showing up in a ways that you don't believe in them and you wonder why they act like they do. You're the problem, not they're not the problem. But what happened is we got some in the early bits when it was still really up in the air, still a lot of negativity. We got a call one day. I got a call, and it was by it was the Peter F. Drucker Foundation. Now, Peter F. Drucker is the most famous management thinker in the world. He's like the grandfather of all, every any business book you read. Yep. He's the one they dedicated to. Right. He's the he is the OG of business books and <laughs> management theory. <laughs> Peter F. Drucker. He's a true genius. That guy. And he created a foundation and he gives out innovation awards. And every year they give out one for social innovation, nonprofit innovation. Yep. And it's the one because he's the guru. Getting that one is big. It's a hundred thousand dollar prize. Right. But really it's Peter Afraka signs off on you. He, he, not him literally. He's he's passed on. His wife was still alive though. And I got a call from them, from the head of that Peter of Trucker. He calls me up. I was actually in the room with Sarah and Saeed when they, they came running in. Someone from the Peter of Trucker Institute is calling. So I go into the office next door. I go, hello. Yeah, it's so-and-so. I can't remember his name. Uh, we want to let you know that you have won the 2012 Peter F. Drucker Innovation Award. So I paused and I said, okay, so I'm going to feed back what I'm understanding. <laughs> he goes, yes. I go, you've entered us in the Peter F. Drucker Innovation Award. And the guy says, no, no, that's not what I said at all. I said, congratulations, you have won the 2012 Peter F. Drucker Innovation Award. I said, okay, let me feed it back to you just one more time. <laughs> I've been shortlisted. We've been shortlisted for the Peter. And the guy's like, what? What is wrong with this dude? What is wrong with this guy? <laughs> but I couldn't bring myself to believe it. And then he goes, you're not hearing me. You've won it. And I said, okay, I'm going to feed it back to you the third <laughs> time. But you don't mess with me, whatever you do, because this has been nothing but uphill. Yeah. And you're telling me that we've won this biggest award. He goes, yeah, you've won that award. So I walked into Syed and Sarah. I said, guess what? <laughs> and they did exactly, exactly the, the same, same thing. thing. <laughs> so you're telling us we've been <laughs> yeah. We went through the Because none of us could believe that it happened. But it happened. Yeah. Wow. And then we went and raised 107 million. It's beautiful. It's a, that's a, you know, at the end of all of that, we sat with my board and the team and I said, Somali community. We did really change also. The mayor launched it. We got them off the front page. We changed actually the way Minnesota viewed the Somali community largely. All that changed. At the end, I just asked people because there was so much, um, people were so scared of what the Somalis would do to us. And I said to anyone, can anyone think of a time, this was like five years in, where the Somalis have been anything but gracious, kind, and good to us? No, we could never think of a single mm. instance. Yeah. Now, if a Somali person was in the room when I said that, they would all look at one another going, I know, I don't know how it happened. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're just humans as well, yeah. right? But it, somehow they, got, they just became the better version of themselves through all this. So can I take you back just a second? You were talking about Bono yeah. and Secretary Clinton. And what was their involvement? That's my second, apart from meeting Mother Teresa, I got a shout out from stage at a stadium tour by Bono. Oh, we had a very interesting meeting today with a, a group working on the famine in the Horn of Africa now. Yeah. Give it up for Daniel. Yeah. You're beautiful. The irony was I'd left like two minutes before he gave me the shout out. Oh. <laughs> So someone sent me the YouTube. What happened is people started hearing about this. And one of the Somali's most famous musicians is a guy called Kanan. 
Mm-hmm. So he's a well-known singer. Okay, I want to introduce you to a very special spirit, a wise man showing great leadership on behalf of his country, Somalia. Get used to his name, because you're going to hear it a lot. His name is Kanan. Somebody call me refugee. Somebody call me refugee. And we've become quite close within the Somali community, and so I knew there's two fashion designers. They're twins. It's called Matano. They're, and with a lot of uh, Somalis produce shockingly gorgeous models and things. And so we would go and hang out in New York, and they were always trying to help their country, and so they would use us as the vehicle to do that because we had this partnership. Yeah. So I became friends with Matano, these two fashion designers, and they introduced us to Kanan. And then Kanan, then we heard that Bono was coming into town to do the stadium tour, and they were like, Bono wants to hear about this diaspora thing, so we met him. And then he calls up Secretary Clinton, so we get a call. Secretary Clinton wants to know about the um, thing. So we talked to these guys, and they're like, this is amazing. This is great. We're going to connect our offices to you and because the famine's happening and uh, we need to all raise money. And so uh, they said we had just – the U.S. State Department had done this fundraiser for Haiti just a, a year or so earlier – and they'd raised $33 million and they were thinking, we want to do a repeat of that for the Somali famine. So we want to get your advice. We hear you're like the Somali whispers. You know how to talk to Somalis and non-Somalis about Somalia in a way that creates optimism and belief. And we said, yes, it's no, we've spent years, 18 months on this. We've worked with IDEO. We've designed this really carefully. And it's true. We can talk about this issue in a way that creates belief and donation but almost everybody else drives it away. So their office is called up. The bosses have told us we have to call you. Okay. (laughs) And then they said, why are we talking to you? They say, you're the ones that know. You're the whisperers, you know, the Somalia whisperers. And we would say, yes, this issue is so distinct. It's such a difficult environment that non-Somalis will, if you don't engage them correctly, you'll actually stop them giving money because they already are inclined to not believe it. Right. So if you do it, go about this the wrong way, you'll actually cement them in disbelief. And the Somali community, if you try to raise money from them and you bring up certain things like the U.S., there's certain things that drive the Somali, like tr- are very triggering for the Somalis. You bring that stuff up, they're going to be real mad at you <laughs> and they're still not going to give you any money. Now, both of these offices, State Department and one campaign were like, uh, you're clearly idiots. Now, they were only slightly off this. They were like, we're actually real experts on all this stuff and we don't need your advice. We're only on this call because a boss has told us to. But the mere notion that you think that we should do anything in the, the famine campaign except tell the – because we said don't – whatever you do, don't go roaring in there. For example, we said – even on colours, we said don't – if you go in hard – Famine, war, death, disease. Yeah, it just changed the narrative. It just and changes it, the narrative it, again. It just makes it like I already knew it was bad, but now I've got like the quintuplet or whatever it is of badness yeah. happening. And and we said it's even practical. Don't use black. Don't use red. Don't use burnt orange. Don't use colors that will just evoke emotions of panic and fear. It will drive people away. So don't use famine. Don't use war. Don't use death and destruction. Mm. Don't use black. Don't use red. Don't you? You can see where this is yeah. going. Burn orange. They go, this is dumb. And we said, if you use those things, you'll stop people giving. They said, there's no such thing as that. Okay. So leave us to do it. Then they, did a, they came together. One campaign came together with the State Department to do a campaign. And then they raised money. They said, we're going to raise all this money in awareness and we're going to give what we raise because it'll be in the 30 millions to seven organisations, of which we were one. Yep. So I know how much they raised because I got one-seventh seventh of what was yeah. raised. And so they went out. And you know what they called the oh, uh, no. the one campaign called it the F word. You can see it on YouTube. Just put in the F word and it, everyone was in black and yet it had the greatest bunch of celebrities you've ever seen in your life. There's so many celebrities on there. I think Brad Pitt only got like a second. Right. It was just a cavalcade of celebrities all swearing. F B. Famine is the real obscenity. Famine. 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 And then the US State Department put theirs out. It was called Famine, War, Drought, FWD. (laughs) And and guess what its colours were? 
black, Fuck. red, and burnt orange. <laughs> oh, no. And these two go out. It's like you they, gave them the playbook of what not to do when they did they it. They did exactly all the things we said don't do. And you can imagine over the time thinking, and watch what happens. Yeah. And so we watched what happens. And what happened? They raised $20,000. Is that right? Both campaigns raised $20,000 because we got sent a check for, what, $2,500? Yeah. Now you might say, well, the point that we were making was is that if you do the, and say the wrong things, you'll actually drive people away. And they said it's just dumb. Yeah. When these two groups raise money and they raise 20000 what that means is they actually stopped giving. Because even a half-hearted effort would have raised, what, $5, $10 million? Yeah. And, uh, and we raised one and a half million. We did a little group in Minneapolis. We raised one and a half, starting with the $8,000 from Shukri. But we ended up raising $1.5 million. And we were the only organization that raised more money comparative to our size than we did for Haiti. It was a big success for us. I was also at a meeting just recently and everyone said the key was on the issue of climate and people said that we have to go negative on this. We have to scare the bejeebas out of everybody. And they were like, that's what gets engagement. And I was like, that's what gets engagement in one way. It's the burning platform again. Yeah, right? but, but it doesn't change behaviour and it doesn't create belief. And if you want to make a difference, what everybody's done is lost belief by just shouting at people and telling them that the world is about to end. It just doesn't work. In order to, for a person to feel like they're unleashed, they have to have some belief and some trust and the knowledge that together with a group of people they can make change. And that what we saw that any instance or any time that we have let people through the door and we've let them participate with us and we've relied on their goodness, I've never had a single instance where it's been abused or let down. Fantastic. Well, if you're listening in Minnesota, or Minneapolis, you should be very proud of what uh, <laughs> of what you've given and what you've created. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Thank you. 